and Humanities in 1993 with a view to creating a platform where fellows could take turns in addressing topical issues in the humanities and the sciences. So this evening, I welcome you all to another educative lecture addressing issues relating to the sciences entitled Biodiversity Conservation, Genetic Resources, Gene Sequencing, and the Nagoya Protocol, Challenges, Dilemmas, and Opportunities. At this moment, I would like to introduce the chairman for this afternoon lecture. The chairman of this lecture is an emeritus professor in the department of food process engineering, University of Ghana. He is a fellow and currently the Vice President of Sciences of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. He also a Fellow of International Academy of Food Science and Technology and a Fellow Kellogg Foundation Leadership Program in Food Systems. He was the Vice Chairman at FAO Who Codex Alimentarius Commission based in Rome and Geneva from 2011 to 2014. He was also the chairman of a planning committee for the establishment of two public universities, namely University of Energy and Natural Resources, Sian, and University of Health and Allied Sciences, or Professor Sifadidi, was the team lead consultant for the development and preparation of Ghana's second millennium challenge compact. He was also the board chairman for the Millennium Development Authority for Ghana's Millennium Challenge Compact One and reappointed chairman for the Millennium Development Authority for Ghana's Millennium Challenge Compact Two till January. 7, 2017. With such experience, we hope Professor Sifadidi, Emeritus Professor Sifadidi, is qualified to assume the duty of chairman of this evening's lecture. I therefore welcome Professor Sifadidi to take his seat and introduce the speaker of the function. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kwabaswa, for the kind introduction. And welcome all our participants. I would say virtual, virtual participants. It's a delight to see an academy, the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences activity, now virtual to reach out at many people at the same time. The president of the academy, past presidents, vice presidents, fellows, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged this evening to have Our speaker is Professor Alfred Apau Tim Jeboa. Professor Tim Jeboa, Professor in Biology, with special interest in taxonomy, systematics, and vegetation studies, and a strong advocate for 
of conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity at the national level. He holds a PhD degree. He's a fellow of the Union Society of London, the Ghana Institute of Biology, and the Ghana Academy of Science. He is a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has held and other associated administrative positions at several universities, including the University of Cape Coast, University of Sokoto in Nigeria, Moore University in Kenya, and the University of Ghana in Canada. We also observe in the CSIR system in Ghana, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, as a Deputy Director General, responsible for national research coordination of issues of the environment and health across Ghana. Professor Otin Yeboah has over 100 publications in books, referee journals, conference proceedings, and over 80 articles in other popular information outlets. Professor Otin Yeboa has served on the boards and councils of many organizations in Ghana and outside Ghana. In Ghana, he has been at the national level, he has served at the Forestry Research Institute of Ghana, Plant Genetic Resources Research Institute, Soil Research and Water Research Institutes. He also chaired the research committee of Mampon Center for Research into Plant Medicine, the management committee of the Cocoa Research Institute of Ghana, the National Bio Bio City Biodiversity Committee of the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, the executive committee within the Environmental EPA Board, the National Scholarships Review Committee of the Ghana Government Scholarship Secretariat. He is a member of the Council of the College of Health Sciences, University of Ghana, the Council of the Center for Research and Plant Medicine, the Board of EPA, the Governing Council of Sergis. Presently, he chairs the National Bioethics and Nat Natural Resource, Natural Sciences Committee, Ghana National Commission for UNESCO, the Board of Eruka, Ghana, the Board of Trompembos, Ghana, the Board of Conservation Alliance. He is also a commissioner of the National Commission of UNESCO. At the international level, he previously chaired the Standing Committee of UNEP-CMS, the subsidiary body on science, technology, and technological advice of the Convention on Biological Diversity for its ninth and 10th meetings. He also chaired the contact groups on forest biodiversity at the sixth conference of parties, COP6 of CBD in The Hague, the Netherlands, protected areas of CBD, COP7 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, marine areas beyond national jurisdiction at CBD, COP8, in Curitiba, Brazil, the expanded work program on protected areas at CBD COP9 in Bonn, Germany, Satoyama Initiative on Sustainable Use of CBD COP10 in Nagoya, Japan, and capacity building of CBD COP13 in Cancun, Mexico. The list goes on and on for Professor Otin Yaboa. Currently, he chairs the Council for African Center for Technology Studies, Nairobi, the Steering Committee of IPSI, of the United Nations University, Institute of Advanced Sustainability, Tokyo, Japan. He is also the Vice Chair of the Bureau of IPBES, born Germany. He is a consultant to the African Forest Forum. He was named the winner of the prestigious International Midori Prize for Biodiversity in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, our lecturer this evening is going to speak to us 
on biodiversity yeah. conservation, genetic resources, gene sequences, and the Nagoya Protocol. Challenges, dilemmas, and opportunities. I am sure Professor Tim Yeboah is going to take us through a very exciting time together. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Otin Yeboa to deliver this year's lecture in science at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Otin Yeboa. Thank you very much for the president of the Academy, the president of the Academy, the vice president of the Academy, fellows of the Academy, distinguished guests, both in Asia and Asia, the press, I have actually considered this as a privilege given to me by my elite fellows in asking me to give this year 2020 annual science lecture. First of all, I want to say how very grateful I am to God for the opportunity that He has given to me through my life. I can actually stand and speak to people across the whole world. I'm also very grateful to the Council and to the Academy, to the Secretariat of the Academy, for all the technical backup that they have so graciously provided to support this and also the presentation of my lecture. Lecture title Conservation, Genetic Resources, Gene Sequencing, and the Nagoya Protocol. And in this, the challenges, the dilemmas, and the opportunities that the result of implementing this particular one. I have a tall outline and I will quickly go through providing the preamble, the introduction, but in particular, the last portion of the presentation will be in the implementation of the access and benefit sharing protocol in Ghana. And I'll be reflecting on one particular issue which has engaged the minds of all those whose genetic resources are being used not aware of it. And I'm referring to digital sequencing information, which has become more or less the order of the day all over the place. As a preamble, I am indicating that the process of manipulation of genetic resources involving techniques in gene sequencing and gene transfers have been welcomed in plant and animal biology for food, agriculture, and medicine. However, there is some level of tradition and some on music. And the reason is purely because of the uncertainty that accompany the use of some of these genes, not having any links at all to the genetic resources from which they were initially extracted. And also because of the loss of benefits to the sources of origin and owners of the associated knowledge that are attached to the risk. Now, with the procedure of altering the genetic composition of the species whose genetic resources have been used, there are legal, social, economic, environmental, and moral implications. Foremost is the socio-economic underpinnings to people, 
especially the local and indigenous local communities, the nations that are contributing the results, and to understand the unprecedented ethical conundrums in such things as equity and fundamental human rights, which are fully part of the negotiated texts and are also enshrined within the Convention on Biological Diversity and its two protocols. The Convention on Biological Diversity was negotiated and agreed in 1992. This happened in June 1992, where governments across the world assembled in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro and they signed an international agreement and endorsed the statutes of the convention, which in short is referred to as the CBD, Convention of Biological Diversity. There are three objectives for this convention, and these are conservation of biological diversity, the sustainable use of biological diversity, and the third objective is the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources, including by appropriate access to genetic resources and by appropriate transfer of relevant technologies, taking into account all rights over those resources and technologies and by appropriate access. Now, when one looks at the third objective closely, this third objective, which is on benefit sharing, indicates that countries and communities that are granting access to their genetic resources and traditional knowledge should receive a share of the benefits that users derive from these resources. Mainly, that is the objective of this particular objective. But what is to be understood by fair and equitable in relation to benefit sharing, however, has not been really made clear. The convention itself, this text, never gave any explicit meaning to the terms fair and equitable sharing. Now, I want to just take a look at what genetic resource is. A genetic resource or resources, if you like, in the plural, are uh, any genetic material of actual or potential value. And it refers to any material of plant, animal, microbial, or other origin containing functional units of heredity. This is how the Convention on Biological Diversity, in its Article 2, published in 1982, described it. Now, the functional unit of heredity are the genes. A lot of us are familiar with the term genes, but what exactly the genes are, many of us are not familiar with. I'm just using different types of hibiscus flower as an illustration. Now, one can see over there, the corolla or the petal is folded like that of an umbrella. This one, the petals are open. Here, the petals are stranded. And over here, we have a completely new version of the petal. Now, what this is illustrating is every one of these will read true. In other words, if we should go back, all the coordinates of this and that and that will continue to be true because of the genetic material, which is the hereditary material, which is inserted in them. So now we want to take a look at the Principle, what is the principle of access and beneficiary? Now, in the spirit of the principle for access and beneficiary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, 
there was provision for the development of opportunities which must aim at ensuring a fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the use of genetic resources. Therefore, wherever genetic resources are used for scientific or commercial purposes, the country of origin of that resource must be recompensed. In other words, must be compensated. Overall, the purpose of the ABS has been fashioned to generate benefits for poverty eradication and nature conservation, for supporting capacity development by transferring technologies, knowledge, and skills across countries, for enhancing social development, for ensuring accountability and good governance at all levels. Therefore, the core mechanism of access and benefit sharing and the basis for any agreement between users, those who are collecting the resource, and providers, those who are giving the genetic resources, are prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms. These are simple English terms, but they are also legal. Prior informed consent is the kind of agreement where you do something or allow something to happen only after all the relevant facts are known. Now, when you bring in prior, what it means is that the consent is sought sufficiently in advance, prior, in advance. And then when you refer to inform, it also suggests that whatever is there, that is the relevant group of people who are going to receive the satisfactory information on the key points. And then consent is agreed. In other words, referring to um, when all the processes, the process or all the processes that are involved in acquiring a genetic resource has been exhausted and people are now saying yes instead of saying no. Or they could even say no. Now, under the Convention of Biological Diversity, the concept of mutually agreed terms means that the access to genetic resources and the sharing of resulting benefits among the parties is done by a competent authority. And the party which is using the genetic resources must be regulated by a contractual agreement, mutually agreed terms. Now the question is, do these two basic concepts happen in Ghana? We are yet to see whether it does happen in Ghana. So why was the need for a protocol? Now the gains and benefits of arising, arising from the transfers of genetic resources to pharmaceuticals and other research groups have hardly ever been shared with the communities from which the genetic resource was picked. Until recently, developing countries had no recourse to ensure that the use of their genetic resources and traditional knowledge would be compensated or recompensed. So the coming into being of the ABS principle was expected to bring the kind of needed leverage However, with the advent of new technologies that blur the exact definitions of ownership of the genetic resource, a big challenge has ensued. Now, this diagram is the normal diagram of the helix of the DNA, which is the gene, the DNA. And if you look very closely, There are four colors that have been picked here. 
the first two you have added time and time go back here. Then the second are one and cycles. Now these are the base pairs which like a ladder are linking the strands of the DNA. The chemical structure of the DNA molecule shows this These are the basic chemical features that make up those bodies that I have referred to as adenine, manine, thysine, thymine, and cytosine. The first chemical component here, this is the nitrogen base, this is the sugar base, and this one is the phosphate base. And if we go back, sorry, I okay. If we go back to this diagram here with the different colors, this is depicting the kind of structure that I'm referring to, which are the actual building blocks for the DNA, which is the G. A closer look will show to us if we could just concentrate on this side here. We have a C with the cytosine, we have an S with the sugar base, and we have a P with the phosphate. This forms one block which is called a nucleotide. And if you look very closely, you see one, two, three, which are bonds of hydrogen that keep cytosine in one together. If you look at this second one here, T and A, there are only two other forms. Which means that from a chemical point of view, there is no way a T will join G, a T will join C, or rather a T will always join A, and vice versa. And as I have mentioned, the hydrogen point the illustration. Here, you can see that there are two hydrogen bonds here, one here and one there, in terms of hydrogen and hydrogen, and three hydrogen bonds in terms of cytosine and one, one, two, and three. Again, from a diagrammatic point of view, you will notice that the G here is referring to guanine, the A is adenine, the C here is referring to cytosine, and the T here is referring to thymine. And you can see the bonding, three bonds and two bonds. Now, when we consider the issue of DNA sequence, I'm sure, again, that's a term that has been heard several times. It is a process of determining the sequence of nucleotides within the DNA molecule. That's the sequence in which the T and A, the C and the G are coming up in the form of a ladder within a genome. Now, every organism's DNA consists of a unique sequence of nucleotides and determining the sequence can actually help scientists to compare DNAs between organisms, DNA between different species, and so on. And this can help actually to show how organisms are related. 
So the relation is now being picked up from the view of the genetic base. Now, by sequencing a strength of DNA, it will be possible to know the order in which the four nucleotides, which are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, how they occur within the nucleic acid molecule. Now, the interesting thing is, when, when the country puts the gene, it's now going to produce a protein. There is another nucleic acid, which is the RNA, which now comes in to align itself against the DNA and replicates itself. And in the process of replication, with the RNA coming in, instead of time, you have Uracil. So you and A are now going to be in the process of being transferred as a genetic material to develop that kind of protein. Now with gene manipulation through restriction, you know, genes are being manipulated now. Previously, it was not possible to do this. But through advancement in the sciences, it is possible to do this. And it's through a type of enzyme which are referred to as restriction enzymes. We refer to these as the molecular scissors. They cut. They cut double-stranded DNA molecules at a specific point. And these restriction enzymes are found naturally in a wide variety of prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are those living organisms in the area of viruses and so on, who do not really have a proper cell. And therefore, they also become an important tool for manipulating the DNA. Now, the mode of action is interesting. I'm going through this because I want to explain how this is possible. And the restriction enzyme is a protein which is produced by bacteria that cleaves the DNA at specific sites. This site is known as the restriction site. But the restriction enzymes recognize short and specific nucleotide sequences in the DNA, which are known as the recognition sequences. And when the restriction enzyme recognizes a DNA sequence, what it does is it hydrolyzes the bond between adjacent nucleotides and cuts through the DNA molecule. When it says hydrolyze, it means those energy bonds, the hydrogen bond, either two bonds or three bonds, are now cut. That's the season. So when we talk, we talk about cutting, that's exactly what it is referring to. Uh, this, this slide, slide here is indicating two types of enzymes that cut the E. Echo and the SNA1. Every one of them has its own function. The FRI is from a particular gene. Okay. Now, this illustration is showing a restriction enzyme which is now coming into the center of a nucleotide. And by the action of a scissor, it cuts. And what you find is that the gene has been cut into two. Like this. And you will notice here is a three bonded and here is a two bonded. Now at the end of the cutting, 
you may have what would say cutting it snuggedly, you know, clean cut. And the other side, you can have a cutting which will show some bits that are hanging. And these are referred to as the um, blunt ends. Okay, this diagram that is showing here is illustrating. This is the G, this is the guanin, A, A, T, T, C. And the corresponding nucleotides are C for G, T for A, T for A, T, A for T, A for T, and G for C. The same way. But in the cutting, you notice that there has been a cut that goes like that. And this is what we refer to as a sticky end cut. And there's a cut that goes straight through, which is referred to as a blunt cell cut. I will not spend too much time here. This is an illustration, again, showing how the arrangements are like when you have a blunt end. C, T, G, G, A, C, T. And you will notice that it's just the same area which are even, even out. Yeah, even out. I'm sure you are familiar with this. This is a dress. A dress that has been made with pieces of textile from different, different ends. And that is exactly what happens when there is a cutting of nucleotides from different different ends and are put together to produce something. That something is not the same as the original, which you would consider as the print type. So you see, you can call about 20 or 30 different textile systems, systems that have been put together here. Now, if the concept of the sequencing is to be understood. What it means is that the genes can be cut and joined at different ends to produce something which is not the natural material, the natural genetic material. So the blunt end, and I don't want to spend any more time here. This example, which I'm showing here, is one in which the uh, the sticky ends, you see, A and A, it is not possible to have A and A, A to, to, you know, come in together. It is not possible. A should always be aligned to a T. So as a result of the cutting, it means that some kind of the uh, nucleotide has been removed. And that is why we refer to that as the sticky end. So now we look at the protocol, because as I the story that I have given, the storyline that I have given is one in which the third objective of the convention is to ensure that there is equitable share of benefits from genetic resources. And please don't make a mistake, mistake to think genetic, genetic resources resource. means the uh, plant materials which you can see, the cocoa beans that you can see, the genetic resource is that which is within, which is the heritable material. What you see on the outside, like myself standing here, I am only a product of a gene formation that has produced me. The gene that is in me is something that I have inherited and that's why I have maybe this type of hair, maybe I have this type of height, Maybe I speak the way I do. All of these are features which are heritable features which are controlled by genes. So the protocol, which is referred to as the Nagoya Protocol on Access to Genetic Resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization to the Convention of Biological Diversity. This is referred to as the Nagoya Protocol. Now, this protocol sets out obligations for its contracting parties. By contracting parties, we are referring to nations that have agreed to be part of the program of, of the protocol. And they are supposed to take measures 
to in relation to access to genetic resources, benefit sharing, and compliance. Patients the protocol was adopted agreed to be part of the on 29th of October 2010 protocol. in Nagoya, Japan. And they are supposed to take and measures. And it into force on 12th October 2014. Now, when we say something enters into force, what it means is that you have 50 nations or 50 countries ratifying. And after the 50th ratification, we say the protocol or whatever the agreement is, has come into force. So, as of September 2020, it had been ratified by 127 parties, which includes 128 UN states, member states, and the European Union, and 92 signatures. Ghana signed the protocol on the 20th of May 2011. We ratified it on the 8th of August 2019. And therefore, Ghana became a party after three months on the 6th November 2019. Now, the protocol is an internationally agreed and binding framework for access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization. The protocol enhances legal certainty and transparency and this it does by creating predictable conditions for accessing genetic resources and traditional knowledge associated with them by promoting adequate benefit sharing where genetic resources leave the territory of the provider like Ghana and associated traditional knowledge that is being utilized and it also enhances legal certainty and transparency for users and providers by supporting mechanisms to monitor and ensure stakeholders compliance with mutually agreed terms and national ABS regulatory frameworks. The Nagoya protocol can be regarded as a key element in designing a global framework for sustainable development. What do we mean by this? And this is by valuing biodiversity in a market economy approach. It further represents a building block for a global green economy. So if you have genetic resources which you are exchanging, the levels of exchange can be looked as stocks. So the protocol reiterates the sovereign rights of states over their natural resources and also stipulates that prior informed consent, which is PIC, with the custodians of the genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge is a prerequisite for adequate access. So before access is granted, Mutually agreed terms between the parties need to be agreed upon based on clear rules and procedures. Now we come to the challenge. What is the challenge? Now the use of genetic sequence information, which uh, is uh, digital sequence information, or in brief referred to as the DSI, which is stored online, both at public and private databases, and the potential of using the sequence information to develop commercial products without physically assessing the genetic resources. What is the meaning of this? What it means is this, that with the DSI, which is an online database. Anybody can access that database. And in assessing that database, what it means is that the configuration of the nucleotides of a particular gene can easily be assessed without 
physically getting the genetic resource from anywhere. Just going onto the net and it's like something on sale and you pick it up. So that's one of the challenges. Now, the pace at which the digital sequence information is being generated and stored and the potential for appropriation of this information during commercialization of genetic resources and associated knowledge are issues of concern for local people. And of course, we can understand why this is an issue of concern. Because if you need my genetic resources, you have to go through PIC and you have to go through M80. Now with the DS, I, you don't have to approach me. You don't have to talk to me. You can easily get access to this information and use it to build anything that you want to build. In that case, whoever had been the provider at the initial stages, which was synthesized and identified, is the loser. Now, in this scenario, the rights of traditional knowledge holders could be in jeopardized can be in jeopardy and the requirement for prior informed consent is now diminished. In this rapidly evolving technology landscape, the objectives and implementation of the Nagoya protocol could be potentially undermined as could the CBD, that's the Convention of Biological Diversity itself be. So, DSI is presently being accumulated at a rate faster than it can be completely utilized. Now that becomes a challenge. Now, how did DSI get into the world's attention? The, dish, the issue of DSI first came into the international agenda of the International Treaty for Genetic Resources, Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture in the year 2013 at its fifth governing board meeting. This was in the context of discussing uh, uh, how to enhance the multilateral system. Now the multilateral system, <coughs> if, I have, if I have to explain it, there are a set of crops which have been collected over the years and have now become like the usual common for everybody. It's for the use of everybody. And that's the multilateral system. And therefore, no country can own or can have access, sorry, no country can own it as their own thing. It's now become a global common, something which everybody must use. Now, one of the points on discussion was on the comment, commitments to review and change the multilateral access and benefit sharing mechanism to prevent pillaging of the system by patents on native traits. Because in this country, for example, if you talk of pepper, there are several types of pepper, which are used for several types of dishes. All of these have names, and all of these, the knowledge about them are with the people who use them. Now, if somebody wants to develop, for example, using pepper as a pepper spray, and he picks the very hot one, which is now becoming scarce, capsicum anum, or inshrawa, that's the local name. We, 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 people don't find them now, but they are there. Now, the use of that particular one to develop pepper spray, who takes the benefit if the gene in this particular species is on the net and available? So any country, any rogue country can pick it up. So the core of the International Treaty for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture uh, is to ensure that the genetic resources comprising many important crops and forages are always available. Now in November, 2019, I'm so bringing out how the DSI issue came into the world's attention. 
In November 2019, during the eighth meeting of the governing body of the treaty, which we refer to as the GB8, they considered the outcome of nine formal meetings of a working group, which was looking at this topic. Now, DSI is the main outstanding issue which is preventing consensus in the adoption of a new standard material transfer agreement. The reason is simply the African region feels that the DSI issue must be properly investigated and therefore the African region has indicated that it will not accept a revised SMTA, which is the Standardized Material Transfer Agreement, which will not contain provisions on access and benefit sharing for DSI, but will prefer to have statements such as associated information, including genetic sequence data, and not specifically DSI. So it means that DSI has become the contentious issue at the global level. Negotiations on this are ongoing. Now, it's interesting to note that there is a huge stakeholder community who are assembled in the digital sequence information debate. There is those that are responsible for making decisions at the international level, which includes Ghana as a party of the CBD. So we are interested in that. We are a stakeholder. There are other governments which are not, but which is interested in the DSI, including the United States of America. There are those with an interest in the potential impact on benefit sharing. So you can see there's a whole range of stakeholders. Everybody wants to see something done to this particular issue because it is disturbing a globally agreed agreement on access and benefit sharing. Now, what is the use of the DSI? I've just picked up a few points. DSI, which is Digital Sequence Information, is regularly used as a tool in research and development. And some of the examples which we know are in identification of known microbes, in the identification of genetically modified organisms. It's also used for basic research, particularly in taxonomic work where one wants to understand the genetic relationships in a group of animals or a group of plants. Also, in the development of DNA barcodes where you will be able to pick a relationship based on what kind of features are showing. It's also for applied sciences such as uh, plant and animal breeding systems, if you want to breed uh, specific types of organisms, DSI as a tool is very useful there. It's also to modify genes which are subsequently inserted into bacteria so that they can be useful genes in a particular genetic right. And then the last one, uh, there are many examples of uh, transgenic organisms that are existing that have been developed to produce ingredients for medicines or other industrial ingredients. Now, this can replace farm-based production of traditional medicinal plants through industrial fermentation or by farming transgenic plants. So that becomes an issue. Now, these two points are particularly 
very worrying. So the challenges in dealing with DSI. Many developing countries have clearly indicated that they are not prepared to accept a situation in which the use of DSI continues without benefit sharing obligations. This is because there is no international agreement on how DSI should be handled. Many challenges are known to be associated with regulating DSI through bilateral approaches, including monitoring and compliance associated with data use around the world. And some parties, including African countries or the Africa group, have suggested that a multilateral approach in dealing with DSI will make more sense, example, by adopting a global benefit sharing mechanism under Article 10 of the Nagoya Protocol. Now, by Article 10, it says, allow parties the opportunity to think about the need for and potential modalities of a multilateral mechanism to address benefit sharing in certain situations, that is when genetic resources and the associated traditional knowledge occur in transboundary situations, or it is not possible to grant or obtain PIC for the utilization of these resources. So we now look at the opportunities that are available to the convention and also to the ABS in the Sustainable Development Goals. The CBD and the ABS have roles in fulfillment of the SDGs, both directly and indirectly, through support for health-related research. If you look at the SDG goals 1 through to 17, there are issues that have to do with one health, human health, animal health, world health, and environment health. All of these are related. Then encouraging the development of biodiversity-based value chains and economic development in local communities by transfer of technology. This has been one bone of contention over the years ever since the United Nations came into being. Transfer of technology. Then development of effective, accountable, and transparent institutions, including in research and development chains. I can go on and on which are all indicating the issue to do with sustainable development goals. So what are Ghana's obligations to the protocol? Now, having signed and ratified the protocol on the 20th of May, 2011, and the 8th of August 2019, respectively, and therefore becoming a party to the protocol since the 8th of November 2019, there are a number of obligations to implement, including the decisions of COP 1420. That's COP is Conference of Parties, which is the decision-making body at the international level. And I have listed a few areas which, as policy guidance, we ought to commit ourselves to. First of all, we need to have the, the development, development of the legislative framework for Ghana to domesticate the articles of the protocol. Secondly, we need to have the designation of a competent national authority. I will explain these in a minute. Thirdly, the recognition of a dedicated center or office for the monitoring, documentation, and gatekeeping arrangements for the access and benefit sharing issues in Ghana. The identification of the capacity development needs for ABS infrastructure for Ghana. The development 
of in-country research capacity and institutions, including the assemblage of the necessary expertise needed for data capture and training in capacity development. Then the organization of national discussion, the organization of a national discussion on all aspects of gene sequencing, including digital sequence information and lastly, inventorization of all biological materials that have formed part of the non-traditional export products in collaboration with the Ghana Export Promotion Council of the Ministry of Trade and all the relevant national institutions. The first one is legislation framework. Every now and then, the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation is bombarded with requests because Ghana has become a party to the protocol with requests for PIC, with requests for MAT but we don't have any legislation to support this. And the ministry is at a loss what to do. And that's why there's a need to have legislation which will guide the proper use of genetic resources of the country that will move outside this country. So that one advantage is that we will know where the materials are going, we will know how the material is being used, we also have an idea of any use beyond what the, uh, the, the, the user had indicated that they are going to use that material for. Then the designation of a competent national authority. Fortunately for us in this country, we have had this process, uh, process before, where we have the National Biosafety Authority, which is the authority which regulates the use of genetically modified organisms or GMOs or whatever within this country. So any organization, any institution, any research lab that wants to participate in research that deals with gene transfers and so on and so forth, that is the authority. It's needed for the ABS in Ghana. So that all issues to do with PIC, all issues to do with MAT, they are handling. And as they are handling, they have specific agents, they have specific offices, they have specific tables that are dealing with the monitoring of all of these. So through this authority, the Ministry of Trade, uh, Trade through the agency of the National uh, Promotion Council, who talks about non-traditional exports and so on and so forth. They have to relate in tandem with them and also with EPA so that Ghana is able to record what are the genetic resources that are going out. All that we get to know is that groundnuts, peanuts, just mention them have fetched this country so much. But beyond that so much, the genetic resource is being turned into something else, which is another value, which will be of interest to us if we have to follow. The next is the recognition of a dedicated center or office. I mean, that one is related to the second bullet point. But my main concern is in the development of capacity building. We have very able scientists in this country. And young ones are coming up who are being trained in the universities. And of course, these days with the high throughput technologies being available using PCRs. And let me remind you, when Ghana decided to open its borders 
the Kotoka International Airport. Travelers passing through within 15 minutes or so, they go through screens and whether they have the virus or they do not have the virus, it's easily determined. So it's now possible to be able to determine the genetic resources of this country and record them. You record them according to the manner in which the genetic sequences, the A and T, the G and the C, the way they have been arranged in that order. In fact, the A and the T and the G and the C, how the combinations have been made with the two bond, the three bond, the two bond, and the way in which they are sequenced makes a duty. We ought to have people with that knowledge who will always, like an atlas, develop these for the benefit of the country. Then the development of in-country research capacity, of course, our, uh, our universities, especially the genetic um, uh, departments who are looking at genetic resources of cowpea and so on and so forth, all of these are trained more and more students. And they have to be charged to be looking strictly into the Ghanaian genetic resource and recording so that we'll be able to have a signature information of all of these made available. So, Mr. Chairman, and I am making a reference now to the president of the academy, the um, past presidents of the academy, the vice presidents of the academy, and fellows of the academy, and to the viewers out there in the field, both presentia here and in absentia. This is the message that I want to bring across, that if we had been sleeping, it is now time for us to wake up and make sure that that which God has endowed to this nation as a genetic resource, apart from just selling them in their phenotypic form, in other words, their life structures as they are, we can derive more benefits, more benefits. And that will raise our GDP to a point which is beyond anybody's comprehension. So I'd like to thank all of you for listening to me in this short period of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ting Yeboah, thank you for this very exciting lecture, taking us through the various, very important issues that we need to take note of as a nation. Excellent presentation, and thank you very much for enlightening all, all of us. Our lecturer has taken us through the legal, social, economic, environmental and moral implications of a very important area that we may have gone to sleep on as a nation. I believe his lecture is a wake up call for us as a nation to look at the structures we need to set up so we understand what we have as a people as genetic resources and how this is used both locally and also in the international arena. He took us through the basics of genetics, the DNA structure, the chemistry, took us through the enzymes that are used to break them down and then put them back together to form new materials. Indeed, a lot of information has been presented. The DSI, the digital sequence information was an exciting part of his lecture. He spent quite a bit of time explaining the DSI, its benefits, and also some of the challenges associated with it. I pray that this lecture will be available also in print and in policy form 
to guide the discussion further in this country. So Professor, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, audience, for... And thank you, the audience. <laughs> thank you, audience, for listening to our lecturer. And uh, I hope you do well to digest this topic and see how best Ghana can benefit from this. I have few announcements to make before we close. Uh, as one of the important activity of the academy, that is the Gas Founders Week 2020, we are going to have the week from Tuesday 17th to Friday 20th November 2020. And the topic for this Founders Week is this COVID-19 pandemic. And it's going to last the first three days. We will have induction of fellows by our president, and it will be chaired by Professor Abandam, immediate past president, and it will take place at 5 p.m. On day two, there will be a symposium of two speakers on the sub theme, science, epidi epidemiology, and globalization. It will be presented by two speakers, Professor John Japon and Professor Dr. Dr. Daniel Bo. And this day two will be chaired by Emeritus Professor Sefadede, Vice President Sciences. And it will take place at 5 p.m. Day three, that is Thursday, 19th November. It deals with another sub theme of socioeconomics and innovations and opportunities. And there will be two speakers who will be Dr. Elsie Efa Kufman and Dr. Franklin Obinodu. And it will be chaired by Professor Kofi Anidoho, Vice President Arts. And it will take place at 5 p.m. And the day four is dedicated to Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lecture on the theme, building a lasting democratic culture through the exercise of political religious tolerance. It will be given by Most Reverend Emeritus, Dr. Peter Akwesisapo, Emeritus Archbishop of Kumasi Diocese. And the chair will be our president, Professor Justice Mensa Bonso. And it will take place at 5 p.m. We wish all of you will either be at the Zoom platform or the Facebook, or if things become better, we will all assemble and listen to very important topic. I thank you very much for your attention and for being with us this evening. Thank you.
organizations that have agreed to be part of the program of, of the protocol. And they are supposed to take measures to, in relation to access to genetic resources, benefit sharing, and compliance. Organizations that have agreed to be part of the program of, of the protocol resources and associated traditional knowledge is a prerequisite for adequate access. So before access is granted, mutually agreed terms between the that they are going to use that material for. Then the designation of a competent national authority. Fortunately for us in this country, we have had this process, uh, process before, where we have the national biosafety. Just mentioned them, have fetched this country so much. But beyond that so much, the genetic resource is being turned into something else, which is another value which will be of interest to us if we have to follow. Promoting adequate benefit sharing where genetic resources leave the territory of the provider, like Ghana, and associated traditional knowledge that is being patients that have agreed to be part of the program of, of the protocol. And they are supposed to take measures to, in relation to access to genetic resources, benefit sharing, and compliance. Genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge is a prerequisite for adequate access. So before access is granted, mutually agreed terms between the data that they are going to use that material for. Then the designation of a competent national authority. Fortunately for us in this country, we have had this process before, where we have the national biosafety promoting adequate benefit sharing where genetic resources leave the territory of the provider, like Ghana, and associated traditional knowledge that is being utilized. Patients that